If you have a Bible, Mark chapter 15. And, and I would submit to you that Mark chapter 15 is a very sacred chapter. You say, why, why sacred? Well, it's the account where Mark reports of the crucifixion. And the crucifixion is a sacred time in Scripture. It's a sacred time in our world. And, and Mark's description of the crucifixion is different than all the other Gospels. Mark leaves out many things that Matthew, Luke, and John include in their writings. For instance, the, you probably have heard of the seven sayings on the cross. Jesus says seven things while he's being crucified. Mark only records one of those things. He, he has a different look, if you will, a different perspective of the crucifixion. And, and let me start where we left off last week. We, we pick up the story in chapter 15 with verse 16. Then the soldiers led him away into the hall called Praetorium, and they called together the whole garrison. They clothed him with purple. They twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head and began to salute him and hail king of the Jews. They struck him on the head with a reed and spit upon him, and bowing the knee, they, they worshiped him. And when they had mocked him, they took the purple off him, put his own clothes back on him, and led him out to crucify him. This mockery of Jesus is an unusual scene, unexpected. This was not a common thing for those who were sentenced to be crucified, to be mocked before they were taken to the hill or to the cross. I mean, think about it. These soldiers are an execution squad. They're very accustomed to death and carrying out these very gruesome, horrendous orders. I think they were very hardened men. They, they could take a man out and nail him, screaming, yelling in pain for mercy, nail him to a cross, and then go out for breakfast. These guys were, were intense. So this mockery is unusual. Look what it says in verse 16. The soldiers led him away into the hall called Praetorium, and they called together the whole garrison. Hey, let's get all the guys in here. Now, now I looked up you know, how many are in a garrison, and it can range from 1,000 to 10,000. I don't think they had 10,000 guys in there, but it was a large crowd, hundreds of men. It's like a spontaneous show erupted. Hey, we got this Jew. He claims to be the king of the Jews. And so they decided to indulge in the humiliation, the, the degradation of Jesus. A reed was used. In other gospels, it said they put it in his hand like it was a scepter, like he was a king. They struck him with it. They made a crown of thorns. If, if you ever go to Israel, you can f see these bushes where, where many of the people say this would have been the type of thorns they used. And they're, they're big. They're like this long, these thorns. And they pushed it into his head. They spit on him. They bowed before him. They, they put some purple cloth on him to represent royalty. And they made a total ridicule of Jesus and his claim to be a king. He had already been beaten and scourged before this. These Romans, well, let me have your attention. They hated the Jews. And these soldiers, probably many of them, were, were just there in Jerusalem for the Passover because the Passover was a time when thousands and thousands of Jews made their way into Jerusalem for one of the greatest feasts of the year, the Passover. And so they would have to bring in more soldiers to, to make sure no kind of a riot erupted or any kind of scene that would get out of control. And so many of these soldiers are probably there, away from their family. 
away from the comfort of home and the, the things they were used to. And, the, and they're, they're, they're watching all these Jewish people come in from all over the world. And most of them don't want to be there. In fact, there was a place down on the Mediterranean in Caesarea, they, they called it Caesarea, that most of them would hang out just to get away from the Jewish-dominated cities. And so they have this Jew who claims to be king. And it seems like this, this anger erupts, all this bitterness and bigotry and racism erupts around Jesus. It tells us that when they had mocked him, verse 20, they took the purple off him and put his own clothes on him and led him out to crucify him. Now, now Mark is not real descriptive about the crucifixion. He limits his account to very short passages. He doesn't get into the gruesome details or, or, or how horrendous it is, and, and, and neither do I wish to do that. But, but listen to some of the things he does say. Verse 21, they compelled a certain man, Simon, a Cyrenian, the father of Alexander and Rufus, as he was coming out of the country and passing by to bear the cross. And we'll come back to that in a minute. They brought him to the place Golgotha, which is translated place of the skull. They gave him wine mingled with myrrh to drink, but, but he did not take it. This was to dull the pain. When they crucified him, they divided his garments, casting lots for them to determine what every man should take. And then in verse 25, just four short words, it was the third hour, and they crucified him. Mark skips over the whole first three hours of Jesus on the cross. And, and he takes us all the way to the ninth hour. If you have a Bible, look at verse 33. When the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And the ninth hour, verse 34 Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Elo, Elo, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The, the final thing said about the cross is here in verse 37, and Jesus cried with a loud voice and breathed his last. And the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now, that's his account of the crucifixion. The, the, the rest of the Mark's account focuses on the people, the crowd, the cross. And, and it's not what people see on the cross that Mark directs our attention to. He gives most of the attention to the view from the cross, looking at the crowd. Mark focuses on the group of individuals that, that are there witnessing the crucifixion, how they respond to the cross. That, that seems to be Mark's message, the, the reaction of the crucifixion of Jesus from those who are standing around observing. See, see here's the deal. If Jesus were crucified today, some of the same type of people would be gathered around the cross. Some of the same responses, some of the same attitudes, some of the same reactions perhaps would be seen today as it was seen here in the Gospel of Mark chapter 13. The, the, the first person that's mentioned is this Simon the Cyrene. So they compelled a certain man, verse 21, Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and, and Rufus, as he was coming out of the country and passing by, they caused him to bear the cross. A Cyrene. 
He's from North Africa. He's there to celebrate the Passover. And he's, he's forced into carrying the cross. Most, most likely the, the horizontal beam, the, the vertical one would already be there waiting. And there he is coming in from the country, probably where he was residing, just coming into the city of Jerusalem. And suddenly he's constricted by the soldiers because Jesus had stumbled once. He had stumbled twice, as it tells us in some of the other gospels. And he's forced into carrying the cross. Suddenly, he's impacted by a, a condemned prisoner who, who's bloody and, and beaten. And out of nowhere, he's, well, okay, he's chosen. Probably a little put out, wouldn't you think? I mean, you're there for Passover, you're there to celebrate, and next thing you know, you're in the middle of a crucifixion. A radical, unwanted change in his schedule. Let me ask you a question. Ever had your plans changed by God? They're not always pleasant. Sometimes they are. My, my whole life was radically interrupted by God at the age of 18. I thought, man, I'm going to stay in the surf industry with my older brother and, you know, travel. And, and all of a sudden, God came knocking on my door and said, I got some different plans for you. God can interrupt your schedule. Sometimes it's pleasant, sometimes not so pleasant. Wasn't that long ago, a couple of months ago, I had about 50-something people, and we were all going to Israel together. Boy, those plans got radically changed by a war. And a bunch of us lost $250 in the deal. I remember it wasn't long ago, I was going to fly to Merritt Island and speak for a Pastor Malcolm at his church, and I, I got to Orlando. It was late at night, and I, I was making my way to my next gate. I got there, and the, the lady at the gate said, are you going to Orlando? I go, yeah. She goes, all flights to Orlando are canceled. I go, what? I said, well, what am I supposed to do? She goes, well, you can get a hotel. I go, I don't want to get a hotel. She goes, well, you can go back to the gate you just came out of, and they're leaving in 20 minutes. I said, can I get on that flight? She goes, yeah. So I called my wife, and I said, Lynn, I'm on my way home. She goes, what? Darn. <laughs> I thought you were gone for the weekend. <laughs> no, I'm on my way back. God interrupted her schedule, I think, more than mine. I'll never forget when we started the church. We were over in the school, and it, the church was starting to grow a little bit, and, and we were getting ready to have our second child, our daughter Jennifer. It was a freezing cold day. I'll never forget it. And I had asked some people to please lock up. I was, I was going to get out of the service Sunday morning, and it was time for Lynn to come home with our little baby girl, and I was going to pick her up at the airport, uh, not the airport, at, at the hospital, <laughs> and, and I'm... And I'm get out. I'm heading towards the, the hospital in Pensacola, the old Baptist, and, and I get to the bridge, and there's police everywhere. And I'm pulling up. I'm thinking, what in the world is going on? And I get right up to the bridge, and the Gulf Breeze police stop me, and I roll down my window and go, what's going on? He goes, sorry, sir, you can't go over the bridge. Why? He goes, completely froze over. And I'm looking at the bridge. There's no ice. There's no nothing. I says, are you out of your mind? I said, this is not, f sir. Police can get a little intense sometimes. I, I said, it's not, I, I said, I lived in Kansas City for three years. It's not even, there's no ice on that bridge, sir. Okay. So I go back to my mom's house, and every hour I call the police station. Has it melted yet? <laughs> and I call Lynn. Lynn, the bridge is completely froze over. Oh, come on. What are you doing? No, it's, it's froze over. We get uptight and resentful when things are canceled or someone doesn't do their part. I'm sure Simon the Serene must have thought, I'm in the midst of a, of a crucifixion. I was coming to celebrate, to, to enjoy Passover, and, and now here I am carrying this cross. It's, it's, it's got blood on it from this man, and what in the world? 
His children are mentioned here by, by, by the writer Mark, uh, Rufus and Alexander. And they may be the, the, the well-known Gentile Roman audience of Mark. They, they may be the, the people Paul writes about in chapter 16 where he mentions Rufus and his mother who had been kind to Paul. Simon may have been so impacted by this situation that he became a believer. This, this interruption in his life may have been the most special day of his life. And you never know. God has a way, does he not, of changing our plans. And sometimes what looks horrible can be the greatest blessing of all. At the foot of the cross are the soldiers who performed the crucifixion. They, they crucified Jesus that day and several others. It was another day at work for them, so to speak. They go about their business, and it tells us in verse 24, and when they crucified him, they divided his garments. And they're just casting lots to determine what everyone should take. Can you imagine? Probably one of the greatest situations on earth, Jesus Christ is dying on a cross. And here are these men, oblivious, disinterested. They're more concerned about money and games than they are about what's happening right before them, which has been prophesied and, and waited for from the beginning of time. Jesus Christ being crucified. Not dialed in, have no idea what it means. And there's so many people like that today in our world. It's a picture of people who have no interest in the story of the cross. No, no interest or understanding of what God is doing in our world. Indifferent. Rather play a game. Watch football. Go to the casino and gamble. Make money. This is a, a picture. Mark, Mark paints this picture of all these different people who intersect with the cross and, and, and what they, how, how they respond. We have two others crucified on either, either side of Jesus. Thieves, robbers. It tells us in verse 27, with him they also crucified two robbers. Two thieves, one on his right the other on his left. And in verse 32, they're, 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 they're railing against Jesus. Let, let, let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe even those who were crucified with him reviled him. Here they are guilty of their crimes, sentenced to death, and they, they see Jesus and, and think, well, he's just like us. Guilty, deserving of punishment, of death. So, so they revile him, they insult him, they ridicule him, they taunt Jesus. I mean, it's bad enough being on a cross and you have those next to you who, who are receiving justice, insulting you, and you're without guilt. One of the other gospels tells us that one of them fi finally realizes that Jesus is innocent. He recognizes and somehow he, he, he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And it's an amazing picture. I'm sure you've heard it uh, of, of, of all, all mankind, one on the right, one on the left, one, one who does not believe and one who does. And that's the story of life. Some believe, some do not. Some insult Jesus and think less of him, and some believe. In verse 29, you have, you have those passing by, it says. Verse 29, and, and those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who destroy the temple and built it in three days, save yourself, come, come down from the cross. 
they had heard some of the claims that the witnesses in the court case had shared. Oh, he said he could, you know, destroy the temple and he would raise it up in three days. And it says they blasphemed him. And they said, ha ha, which is, which, which is a, 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 a word that means to sneer or to deride or, or to laugh. And there's many today who hear the claims of Jesus. Especially this one where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but through me. And people laugh. <laughs> yeah, right, Jesus. Come on. God just gives one door. God just gives one way with, with all the varieties of flowers and different races and cultures. God's going to give one single way. Born of a virgin? Yeah, right. Come on. And people laugh and sneer. They shake their heads. They ridicule God's grace and God's gift. And yet hanging there on the cross is the Son of God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who took your place and my place. In, in verse 31, and likewise the chief priests, and, and all through this, this crucifixion, Mark is painting pictures of all these different responses to the cross. The chief priests also mocking among themselves with the scribes. He saved others. Can't save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. Boy, the, these priests had been so envious and afraid of Jesus and his popularity. All the crowds that he drew, thousands and thousands, the scripture says. His amazing miracles that, that, that echoed all over the land of Israel. His power and abilities. And now they have their moment. Gloating over his helplessness. Save yourself, they cried out with their robes and their re religious ornaments on. Proud and jealous. Come off the cross. We'll believe. Come down. They reject Jesus Christ and who he is. They have no idea what he's doing on the cross. They have no understanding that, that he has just become the Passover lamb for them. And a lot of people reject Jesus, want nothing to do with the cross. No understanding of the blood or the need for a sacrifice or a substitute for sin. The Apostle Paul would later say to the Galatians, if you know that book, they're drifting back into legalism, back into Judaism. Laws and rules and traditions, that's what these men were all about. The Apostle Paul would say to the Galatians, you're, you're drifting into another gospel, a different gospel. Because here's the deal. The cross is the very center of the gospel. You don't want Jesus to come down off that cross. In, in chapter 15, verse 35... Some of those who stood by when they heard that he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Look, he's, he's calling for Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge full of sour wine and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink, saying, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will, will, will come take him down. This person first you think oh, all right a guy who cares he, he's he's trying to to ease the pain with this with this anesthetic this this will deaden the pain and the suffering but here's the thing he's not moved by compassion he's not bringing the 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 vinegar or whatever it might be to deaden the pain so so jesus might might be relieved he wants to see if elijah will come let's keep him alive He's, call, he, he's misunderstood what Jesus has said, and, and he thinks he's calling for life. So he says, let's see what happens. He's moved not by compassion, but by 
curiosity. He wants to be entertained. Let's see what happens. It says, like the people stopping t- uh, to, to, to see if the guy will jump from a high rise in a big city. You ever seen that scenario where some guy's out on a ledge and the crowds just gather? They're not there out of compassion. In fact, some of them sometimes yell, jump! <laughs> they want to see something happen. That's this guy. Wants to see if, if Elijah will come. Not, not interested in Jesus, just seeking entertainment, the show, th- there for that. And at this point, Jesus breathes his last. It tells us, and Jesus cried out, verse 37, with a loud voice and breathed his last. Hopefully you don't follow Jesus just for entertainment or comfort or a show. And then there's this centurion who's there. It says in verse 39, so when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the son of God. This Roman centurion is a pagan. He believes in in many gods. But something he saw, something he heard, something he witnessed, Suddenly he became aware what he was experiencing, that this crucifixion was wrong. And maybe it was, the, he, he, he listened to the character of Christ on the cross, but, but it was too late. He, he speaks in past tense. He says he was the son of God. No hope now all over. He was guiltless, he was good, he was God's man. But... I'm sure the centurion's thinking, but now it's too late. It's over. And a lot of people are like that. They believe Jesus was the Son of God, that he died on the cross, that he rose from the dead. But, but they believe in, intellectually, not in their heart. Not, not with belief that causes them to live in a certain way. It's all intellectual. It's kind of like, I I, I use this illustration sometimes. I believe in George Washington. I believe he's the father of our country. I believe he crossed the Delaware. I believe he's on the dollar bill. But I'm not trusting George Washington for anything. A lot of people believe in Jesus like that. Oh, yeah, I believe Jesus died. He rose from the dead. He's the son of God. But it has no impact upon their life. They're not trusting him for anything. It has to go from here to here and trust in what he did on the cross, not just believe he went to the cross intellectually. In in, in verse 40, got an interesting group. There's these women. In verse 40, there, there were also women looking on from a distance, from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene. Mary, the mother of James, the less, and Joseph and Salome. Who, who followed him and ministered to him when he was in Galilee, and many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. There they are, the women around the crucifixion. And, and I asked the question, where was James? Where was Peter? John, John had been there earlier with, with Jesus' mother, but now he's also gone. Let me just say this about the women. How many of you know women are different than men? (laughs) Emotionally, in a lot of ways. Men have scattered. But these women, they're more relational, I think. They're more emotional and and, and have more empathy. I know my wife has more empathy than I do. I'll say some things sometimes that, John, don't, don't say that. Don't say that to the grandkids. Okay. <laughs> Don't say that to your kids. Okay, okay. And the, the, the men moved on. They scattered. But the women? Something about the women, that they, they still want to be near. They still have this emotional attachment. They still have this love. They still have this empathy. 
Now, now they may be without faith. They may be without hope. But they're not without love. And they're not without empathy. Their hearts are broken and, and they love Jesus. And they're there. They're, they're, they're still at the cross. And, and then we have this final scene. In verse 42, and when the evening had come, because it was the preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, coming and taking courage, went in to Pilate, and he asked for the body. Pilate marveled that he was already dead, and summoning the centurion, he asked him if he had been dead for some time. So when he found out from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. And then he went and brought, bought fine linen, took him down, wrapped him in the linen, and laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out of rock and rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. And Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, observed where they laid him. Joseph of Arimathea is another one in this mix of, of Mark's description of the crucifixion. It seems a secret disciple looking for the kingdom of God. Probably even part of that group that was involved in the trial. He was a, a religious leader. But he hadn't been open about his love and his heart for Jesus. Nothing said in the trial or court. But now, listen, he steps up. Somehow the cross and the death has caused him to step up, to wake up, and I would say also to speak up. And may I submit to you that there comes a time in your faith to be public, to be unashamed, to be counted as one who loves and follows Jesus, let this great demonstration of love and mercy and sacrifice that Jesus has done for you and me, let, let the cross, this, this amazing demonstration of God's heart, awaken your heart and my heart and give us courage to follow Jesus and be unashamed of Jesus. The cross should cause us to recognize our great need and his great love Look at all the characters that Mark demonstrates and shows to us in chapter 15. Where do you fit? Do you see yourself in there at all? M Mark lists some climatic events. And in verse 34, he, 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 he mentions the, the, the final cry of Jesus in the last hour. He's, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then in verse 37, it says, And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. Father, into your hands is what he said, I commend my spirit. No one takes his life. He lays it down. And then, amazing thing happens. About a half a mile away in the Holy of Holies, there in the temple, a place where only the high priest was able to go once a year. There's this cry in the darkness, the dismissing of his spirit, and then there's the rending of that temple, that curtain there in the holies of holies, that is split from the top to the bottom. And Mark brings them all together in order that we might know that the penalty has been paid. It's been paid for the hateful, for the mockers. It's been paid for the cruel. It's been paid for the bystanders. It's been paid for the gamblers and the selfish. It's been paid for the thrill seekers and the hopeless and the fearful and the people who are just emotionally attached or mentally. And now because the veil has been rent in two, we're all able to come to Christ.
to God. The door is wide open because of the cross. And Jesus says, whosoever will now may come. And, and I've heard it put like this. In some ways, Jesus says, as he, as he dies on the cross and he, and he opens the way to heaven for everyone, there he is. He's the, he's the spotless lamb of God who, who dies on the cross for you and me. And he offers you forgiveness and cleansing and grace and mercy by himself taking our penalty. There he is on the cross and he says, you can now go to heaven and you're, you can be free and forgiven. But if you want to go to hell, he says, you'll have to walk over my dead body. And that's how much he loves you. That's how much he cares for you. He gave his life for you and I. In fact, the day before we leave, we, we celebrate that by taking communion together with the cup and the blood. L let me read a verse from 2 Corinthians that, that Paul put it like this, talking about what Christ has done. For he made him, speaking of Jesus, who knew no sin. Have any of you ever sinned? He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That happened on the cross. And, and this is a sacred chapter in the Bible, Mark chapter 15, where he exposes us to all the different responses. And I would say that you and I, because of the cross, get to celebrate God's interruption in our life and, and ask ourselves, well, which one of these people was, was I? And be grateful and celebratory of the fact that Jesus Christ has washed us and cleansed us and set us free by the power and the amazing work that he did for you and I on that cross. Isn't that amazing? He came to set us free. And he did so by taking our place on a cruel Roman cross on a place called Golgotha. And he died for you, and he died for me, and he has come to interrupt your life and give you freedom and to give you grace and mercy that you and I never, ever could earn, and we certainly don't deserve. Amen? Amen?